Good morning. My name is Wael Mukhtar. I'm the uh, Director of School of Engineering at Grand Valley. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the Co-op Employer Forum. So I would say for over 20 years now, we have been uh, holding this meeting every year, get to work with our partners in industry, talk together about how can we make our education for our students more beneficial, more close to what the industry needs. So this discussion usually starts with, here is what's happening on an industry. And then here is what we do in teaching and how we can create the bridge between them. Partner with industry is maybe the core part in Grand Valley State University. School of Engineering was founded by our partners in industry. And this partnership continue to keep this program alive. I have to say that over the last year with the COVID, this partnership shows how strong it is. Continue co-op over this challenge, working closely with our supporter from industry was something phenomenal. And I cannot say how much we appreciate and thank your contribution to this very important part of our future engineering education. So without much uh, talk from my side, you have a, huge, a very interesting forum this year. We have a nice mix between industry, academia, and of course, this is a forum where we have panelists to talk with you and then hear from you. So if we go to the next slide, I'll introduce the uh, key uh, presenter or coordinator of the event, uh, Diane, which is, as you all know, she is the person in charge of the co-op. She's a chair of assessment, accreditation and co-op, many years industry experience, many years of academic experience. I'm pretty sure you know her maybe more than me because she works very close with industry. So Diane is, is, will be coordinating the, the discussion. Chris is the other very important helper for us. So Diane create the con contact, create the academic side of the co-op and, and employer. Chris gets our student to be ready for you. So talk to you, talk to us and industry, student, faculty, get everybody to make this happen, the co-op and others. So a few more words, and then I'll get Diane to take over. I'll quickly uh, introduce the panelists for today. If we go to the next slide, please. So we have uh, in, in, in two, three, faculty, three uh, uh, experts from industry, uh, three experts from academia, and one expert from industry. So I have Mary from uh, University of uh, Lowellville, and I have Steve from NN Autocam, long-term partner with us. I have Dean Protkowski, who is the founding team, Dean of the School of Engineering. I, I, he maybe can tell you more than me, but he started this school with maybe eight faculty or less. The college now is over, over 70 or 80 faculty and staff. Students are now crossing 2000. So, he will tell you a lot about industry and academia. And Casey is assistant dean for the college. A lot of industry experience and interaction. She is the uh, connection between us and industry. So very interesting panelists. We're looking forward to hear from them. With that, uh, enjoy the forum and I will give it back to uh, Diane. Thank you, Dr. Mokhtar, for the warm welcome and also for your leadership during this past year. As Dr. Mokhtar indicated, I'm the assessment and accreditation uh, leader for the School of Engineering, and I also run the co-op program. That being said, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all the employers out there who maintain the commitment to the co-op program over the past year. Uh, with your assistance, we've been able to maintain 100% of the employment, and this is an incredible achievement. We're very proud of this achievement, and we're glad to thank all of you who were involved in this. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to open the session, which will include university, industry, and national level perspectives to provide future information through future collabor collaboration. The session will end with an open Q&A that is facilitated through the online chat. At this time, I'd like to pass the floor over to Assistant Dean Thalenwood, who will be co-presenting with Dean Pukowski. Casey? Thank you, Diane. 
So Paul and I will be co-presenting as Diane mentioned. And so Paul, jump in here anywhere where you would like. Um, so this presentation is going to focus on maximizing the benefits of an industry university collaboration. And as Dr. Mokhtar mentioned, PCEC programs were developed at the request of and in close coordination with our industry partners. And the goal that we have is to bolster the professional workforce in West Michigan. Over the past 35 plus years, we've shifted the way that we engage with industry in order to meet changes in demand. And we currently have over 300 industry partners. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the five primary ways that we engage with industry and community, which are through the K-12 pipeline, experiential education, applied research and development, talent recruitment, and continuous learning. Next slide, please, thank you. So first of all, K-12 pipeline. Um, PCEC has really dedicated a lot of effort over the years in developing a strong talent pipeline in West Michigan. And West Michigan struggles in building that strong STEM pipeline, just like the rest of the US does. Um, so we've done this by being deeply rooted in the local community. We work closely with K-12 schools and our community partners to provide innovative methods to student engagement, uh, talent development, and problem solving. And our employees, um, I'm hoping your slide looks a little clearer than mine, but there's about 13,000 K-12 students reached um, in the course of a year through our employees in the Padnos College of Engineering and Computing, as well as our students, alumni, and volunteers who help us to have that level of impact. Uh, we do have a dedicated STEM outreach staff member. We have STEM content heavy K-12 programming that we offer, and we focus on building strong partnerships over time so that we're remaining a consistent part of students' experience and that they become familiar with career options in STEM. We also do a lot of sharing of information and resources. And we try to be helpful to our partners by meeting them where they are at. Some of the things we offer are hands-on K-12 workshops, uh, summer camps that expose our K-12 students to STEM, um, and advising for pre-college students. And one of the um, things Paul will cover later on is our new Innovation Development Center, which really provides a unique space and opportunity for us to host some of these things in a new way and engage with industry. Um, as you can see, there are lots of ways for industry to partner with us, um, volunteering to be parts of these camps and events, providing content expertise, sponsoring summer camps or events, hosting tables, and then providing job shadowing opportunities for K-12 students is so important in helping them understand what their career pathways are. So experiential education, this is really at the heart of what we do in the Padnos College. It's heavily ingrained into all of our academic programming. All PCEC students complete a co-op or internship placement um, in a high impact learning environment. They also have lab experiences and conduct industry sponsored projects throughout the course of their academic career. We make this possible by having state-of-the-art facilities that students have access to 24-7. Uh, they can get into the buildings and work on projects on their own schedules and timelines. Um, and we provide a variety of tools for them, such as machine tools, 3D printers, and advanced instrumentation. So really the co-op model, which is why you are all here today, um, distinguishes the engineering program at GVSU from other programs across the country um, and even throughout the world. It is one of only a dozen, um, I think fewer than a dozen in the nation, and there are only a small number more internationally. So this is possible because of you all in West Michigan. We have a large and diverse cutter of employers that partner with us to provide these high quality experiences for our students. And there are a lot of benefits to industry as well. So if you work with us through co-op, you're gaining access to student and faculty expertise to solve problems. Uh, you're gaining brand exposure and awareness for your companies. You have the ability to solve some industry problems at low cost. 
Um, and then also through co-op and internship uh, placements, you're able to kind of determine whether a student is going to be a good fit for a career hire before you go ahead and, and hire that person on long-term. Um, and then you're hiring graduates who already have significant experience working with industry when they graduate from GVSU. Um, so we really appreciate your involvement with us through the co-op internship and then industry-sponsored courses and capstone projects. Applied research and development is also at the heart of how we work with industry in the Padnos College. We have five applied R&D centers, um, which help industry to partner with faculty experts and students to solve industry problems. So we provide a variety of services, um, including application development, incubator spaces, rapid prototyping, um, and more. You can see the opportunities for industry list here. Uh, just briefly, the centers that we have, um, the Applied Computing Institute connects faculty and students with industry to solve problems focused in computer sciences and related disciplines. The Applied Medical Device Institute fills an important need in the medical device community by providing access to researchers, faculty experts, and medical professionals, as well as providing technical service, uh, intellectual property support, business review, and mentoring around medical device design. The Design, Optimization, Evaluation, and Redesign, uh, lovingly called the Doer Center, is the way that we match industry partners with a team of engineering faculty and students to solve industry problems. Um, also, the DT Electromagnetic Compatibility Center is the only university-based facility in the world that provides EMC pre-compliance development and testing support for industry. And then last but not least, Power Mobility Lab is a collaboration with the College of Health Professions at Grand Valley, and it provides solutions to underserved, physically challenged children, such as those who are wheelchair-bound, to help develop custom devices and prepare them um, to be able to drive those devices. Casey, before you move to the next slide, just a couple observations. While each of these R&D centers has a uh, center of focus, we have seen tremendous interest from a variety of industries in connecting with each. So for example, the Applied Medical Device Institute, AMDI, they really help with product design development and commercialization. The focus has been the medical device industry, but companies from across the spectrum that need those kinds of services have come to them to support them as, them as well. And it's been a tremendous success. And the same thing is true of the other areas. Thanks for jumping in there, Paul. That's absolutely true. So around talent recruitment, what we hear a lot from industry partners is that we need more talent in West Michigan and that we can't graduate students fast enough to help support the industry needs. Uh, so we do focus on building that talent pipeline in West Michigan um, in a myriad of ways. So the K-12 outreach, which I mentioned previously, um, we have a new initiative at Grand Valley that we're very excited about. Um, the HBCU HSI Pipeline Consortium, which stands for Historically Black Colleges and Universities and Hispanic Serving Institutions Pipeline Consortium, um, in which we are partnering with those schools to create additional educational opportunities for students and to diversify the talent pipeline here in West Michigan. Uh, we have this experiential education component that I mentioned previously. Uh, we also offer robust research opportunities um, and dedication to student success, and that helps us to attract really talented, qualified people to work at GVSU and helps us to um, improve the expertise within the West Michigan region. Um, we also, well, because of our experiential education model, our graduates also have strong connections that are built with local industry. So we typically uh, have most of our graduates actually remain in West Michigan, oftentimes with the employers that they conducted their co-op or internship placements with. 
Um, and as you can see, there's 75% of our graduates are offered career hires by their co-op or internship employers upon completion. And our students have had a really strong success rate and we've been able to keep about 70% of them in West Michigan, uh, even though only 30 to 40% are actually from West Michigan. So this is another way that we're trying to bring expertise and talent into the region. And again, Casey, if I could jump in. The new HBCU HSI pipeline is an um, effort where we're partnering with institutions to capitalize on uh, their strengths and ours. It's a second pipeline of talent to complement our existing programming. And most of these students are coming in um, late in their undergraduate or for their master's degree. And we um, really, um, want to provide them with an immersive experience uh, on our industry side as well. So uh, our uh, IGF or industry sponsored graduate fellow program, which is um, basically parallel co-op for master students where they work and go to school in parallel rather than alternating uh, is an important part of that. If you would like to uh, discuss more uh, connecting with this new pipeline of students who, of course, are very diverse and we would like to retain in West Michigan, which means uh, engaging with our corporate partners and the vast majority are low income. So this is also how they're going to be able to afford their graduate uh, studies. Uh, please reach out to me and um, we'll pick up the conversation. Yes, thanks, Paul. That's great. We would love to talk to you about partnerships um, around this consortium, so please do reach out. Um, and then I guess the fifth way that we often engage with um, industry is through continuous learning. And what this really comes down to is being flexible to our industry partners and also our student populations um, as changes in demand occur over time so that we are building coursework that is flexible to meet changing industry needs and changing student interests. Um, we are currently intentionally modifying and expanding course offerings to be more accommodating of adult learners, um, as well as to include some components of professional skill development and the need for upscaling that occurs for employees throughout the course of their career. So we are working on reinventing education through providing online and hybrid course offerings, um, such as you'll see, we have eight graduate level badges in computing now. We're also working on creating on ramps into the computing careers for professionals who may have started in a different industry and they're looking to um, enter the STEM fields and go into computing. Uh, we're trying to create courses that are more flexible for non-traditional students who are already working full-time so that they have more options for continuing their education. Um, and we're also trying to balance the student demand for very career-specific skill set training in specific software and tools and devices with the need for um, preparing professionals that are able to be successful long-term by having that broad knowledge base and areas of expertise um, that are needed to adapt to whichever new um, software tools, et cetera, come onto the market. Um, and then after this slide, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. He's going to talk a little bit about the Innovation Design Center. But I did want to mention here one of the unique ways that we partner with industry at the IDC. Uh, Fisher Unitech is one of the companies which co-locates with us in the IDC. And our students benefit from this because they receive convenient access to industry expertise right within the buildings. Um, and then uh, the company also benefits because they can easily collaborate with faculty, share ideas. Um, our students have access to uh, seats and courses free of charge and the ability to use some of the equipment that Fisher Unitech brings into the building and provides for students. Um, and it really creates a win-win situation in which they have access to expertise and space and students and um, and our folks have access um, to learn more about what they're doing and participate in their SOLIDWORKS courses, et cetera. And with that, I will turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. 
So for those of you who have not had a chance to um, visit it yet, our newest facility designed specifically to support the kind of engagement we're talking about is the Innovation and Design Center. Um, we basically, uh, for the locals, this uh, we took over the facility that used to be Ferris Coffee and Nut down on our downtown campus, uh, right next to the YMCA, to give you a little geographic uh, landmark. Um, and we converted the facility uh, to support our project-based learning and really leverage um, what we do and the synergies between enhancing the K-12 pipeline, our students' preparation, and supporting local industry. So if you could go to the next slide. The, uh, a, a large portion of it is designed to, to support uh, industry-based projects and project-based learning, which for us overlap extensively. A lot of our project-based learning, not just the capstones, but throughout the courses uh, comes from our industry partners as well. Uh, the uh, probably most important part, to be honest with you, is what we call the flexible project labs. Uh, we had uh, the design bays in the Keller Engineering Labs, which were phenomenally successful, but didn't come close to meeting the need for space and capacity. Uh, so we have about five times as much space more in this building than we did in Keller. Uh, the basic story here is if you think about your home, you cannot park in your garage and work on your car in there at the same time. Well, the same thing is true in a teaching environment. We cannot teach traditional lab courses and do design and build projects in the same spaces. So these are that space that gets assigned based upon the needs of each course and the projects throughout the course of the year. It's highly flexible and has all of the utilities you could imagine, all the different kinds of power and water and compressed air and all of that sort of thing. Uh, the next element, the team rooms, just as you work in teams, we have our students working in teams with each other and with our corporate partners. So we have uh, several team rooms that are designed to do that both on site and to facilitate multi-site. The rapid prototyping lab and the fabrication labs are to support that type of project-based work um, so that the students can uh, build right on site the elements and subsystems that they need for their projects. And that ranges from uh, 3D printing and laser cutting and plasma cutting uh, to believe it or not in the industrial sewing machines uh, because we do a lot of work where we're trying to fit for children and that sort of thing. Um, and um, uh, double E electrical, uh, prototyping equipment as well. The digital design studios, bottom center photo there, uh, they convert just by having the computers pop up out of the tables from a classroom environment to a computer lab. And most importantly, when you want to get the student's attention back, pop back down into the table so that you can discuss a problem, you can simulate it, and then you can return to the classroom. And then several free form collaboration spaces like you see in the bottom right to allow student groups comfortable environments for gathering and um, discussing their project work, comfortable seating, lots of whiteboard space, lots of computer connectivity uh, in a more relaxed environment. Next slide, please. The pictures that you see here are the K-12 and community engagement space on the top about a third of this space is open space, high bay environment, so that we can set up, tear down and convert um, for whatever purpose we need. What you see there is um, the guts of a first robotics competition field. Uh, it's, the space is large enough to put a full field in. Uh, and 
for example, while it's set up for that in the picture, during the summertime, this is where we would build our complete airplane factory for the steps camp where the students are uh, building their own remote control airplanes. On the bottom right is a space that's still flexible. We use whiteboards instead of walls to be able to size as we need um, so that we can do flexible meeting and teaching kinds of environments. And um, during COVID, this was one of our saving graces, being able to have a very large space like that with the tables really spread out to be able to teach face to face when much of the country and the university had to do much more uh, virtually. Um, so you can see there some of the things that we use it for. Interestingly enough, also in the building is the art preparation facility for the university. We have a substantial um, art collection, when a new, but almost all of it is on display in our academic buildings. So when a new building is going to open, for example, they will prepare two or three or 400 pieces so that the week before the building opens, after the fire marshal signs off, they can charge in and uh, install all of that art. Well, that doesn't happen without a space to do it. And it's a, it's a very closely climate controlled space for when we are storing things for uh, a while. Next, if you would. And with that, that the idea is to give you a sense of that space. We're very proud of it, but I would point out that one of our speakers today, Mary's gonna talk about the other universities you can connect with, of course, outside our area, um, but many of them have designed, added or renovated facilities to be able to do more active and project-based learning. And we encourage you to connect with them as well. With that, I'll hand it over to Steve Heatheis from NN. Uh, they are one of our longest standing corporate partners in a whole bunch of ways that he'll describe. And I think you'll see they're a great example of capitalizing on the opportunities uh, to be able to uh, leverage the resources we bring to the table. Steve, off to you. Thank you, Dean Plekowski, I appreciate it. Um, I guess I'd like to start off by first acknowledging that this is a partnership, but maybe more significantly, it's a relationship that has grown and developed. And I, should, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize where it started. Um, our founding uh, leader had very close ties with the university and the belief in development for um, individuals to grow their skill set and alongside of that grow the opportunities within what it now is known as NN Mobile Solutions, but at the time was AutoCam Corporation. Uh, from that standpoint, I'd also like to uh, share my appreciation for the School of GVSU Engineering. Um, Dean Plotkowski, Professor Mokhtar, uh, Professor Lafreniere are staunch supporters of the opportunity for us to engage, and it's highly appreciated. Uh, and would be remiss to not mention Chris and the Career Center and all the support that we received from him when we just flat out need help finding students. So um, with that standpoint, uh, why don't you go ahead and move to the next slide and I'll introduce a little bit about the NN Mobile Solutions Company. As I mentioned uh, before, the location here in Kentwood was formerly known as um, AutoCam Corporation. In 2014, we were bought by NN Incorporated and has since gone through a couple revisions, but we now exist as NN Mobile Solutions here in Michigan. And we also have NN Power Solutions uh, throughout the North American market and uh, South Asian market as well. We are a leading diversified industrial supplier, uh, primarily around precision metal and plastic components and assembly. Our value add opportunity is design engineering for our customers and a manufacturing capability, material science expertise, and high precision components throughout a variety of markets. We are all over the globe. We're currently headquartered, headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we employ more than 3,300 employees across all of our locations. Go ahead, next slide. So Warren Veltman 
is our current president and chief executive officer. And that's a significant thing to note as Warren used to be the CFO of AutoCam Corporation and in September of 2019 took over as president and CEO of NN. So the culture and the values that we have held dearly here in Kentwood and across the globe as AutoCam have extended now to the entire entity of NN. And you can see our mission is to provide high quality product and service throughout um, the world that continuously exceeds our customer expectations while providing enhanced, enhanced value for our stakeholders. And of course, the vision to be a leading manufacturer of high precision components. What I like to say is that those are simply words on a wall unless we can come through with our behaviors and actions. Go ahead, the next slide. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, formerly known as AutoCam, I, it's, I'd be remiss if I didn't share that the company is, is 31 years old, 32 years old this year. And the reason that's significant is the founding group of employees um, really were in their 20s and 30s. And so as I share this, this overview of our organization, you have to understand that the relationship recognized the need to develop talent as the, the leadership team of the, the former AutoCam Corporation, now NN Mobile Solutions, um, started to move towards the retirement age. And so while we are a global, um, publicly traded organization, uh, we have revenues that we anticipate in 2025 of 600 million. Um, our belief is that growing and developing our talent, both locally and globally, is the recipe for success. Um, our innovative manufacturing technologies, our continuous improvement efforts, and our focus on teams all get developed from the concept that the culture in the organization has to be right in order to meet the demands of our customers in market. Next slide, please. This is just a showcase of some of the elements that we participate in. So I like to say in the automotive sector, if it steers, stops, starts, or shifts, we probably have our fingerprints on those components. Um, fuel delivery being a major component for that. Uh, and that's primarily what we do here in Kentwood. However, across uh, our NN platform, um, you'll see our products likely on the side of your house through the smart meter technology that has been um, introduced throughout North America. And then uh, we have deep relationships in aerospace defense, um, and we continue to grow that business uh, through uh, the last couple of years of development. Next slide. Okay, so what do we do here? Our primary business here in Kentwood is taking bar stock and using uh, you know, existing technologies and new technologies to refine, shave, grind, drill, and craft the parts below. Um, it's valuable to understand that while we talk about machining in a broad spectrum, whether it's milling or turning, our primary skill set here in Kentwood um, happens to be turning. But that doesn't prevent us from going deeper into other segments. And I think that this culture of development and helping our people grow has helped us recently secure business that would be outside of our typical skill set, where we're doing micro milling applications uh, to five micron depths on surface finish and um, channel widths of 400 microns consistently on parts the size of your fingertip. Go ahead, next slide. All right, so our culture. Our culture, as you look on the left, it's similar to anything you'd see with a Toyota production system. It starts with a lean house, but it's understanding the foundation is around our people, making sure that they're trained and we provide an environment for teamwork. Once, once you build from that standpoint, you can see the elements of the production system come into play, but really what we, what we work to do is assess how we're performing. We make sure that our, cost, our culture, customer, and cost is visible throughout the entity. We measure that across uh, our performance standards, and then we continue to refine and build through our area improvement teams. Um, making this visual allows us to be successful and keeps our employees uh, cued in to how we are doing and where we can continue to grow and develop. Next slide. Okay, so the partnership. 
and as I mentioned before, maybe it's better defined as relationship. Um, I think it's significant to note that because of the developed relationship with GVSU, uh, we have been able to find each other sitting at tables alongside working on similar projects and focus. An example would be the K-12 um, pipeline, um, where we're a part of FIRST Robotics throughout West Michigan. We assist and develop and design our own manufacturing camps, as well as support other camps throughout the region. And then we have school partnerships where our team members sit alongside the GBSU team members on boards and advisory panels across West Michigan. We then move to experiential education, and this really is um, you know, the foundation of, of what we do with GVSU. Uh, as Casey mentioned earlier, um, this program is rich and it invites um, success, but it's also not available across the country. And it's something that we're grappling with. We have locations uh, throughout our North American market that we would love to have this program duplicated. Um, and while we are all highly aware of the talent needs in West Michigan, uh, we are also keenly um, paying attention to opportunities for our students uh, to travel into the regions of need and demand as well. We also pay attention and we, we, the relationship has allowed us to leverage the applied R&D side of GVSU. The talent recruitment will speak to last and then the process of continuous learning. Michael, if you go to the K-12 pipeline slide, I appreciate it. So in our K-12 pipeline, as I mentioned before, we're not only a supporter of the FIRST Robotics programs throughout uh, West Michigan, but we partner with the high schools to help them, uh, whether it's guide, uh, foster, or develop uh, students in the manufacturing sector, or if it's as simple as providing a tour. Here we have one of our technicians, Michael Boss, uh, taking a, a group of students from Kellogg'sville uh, Public High School, um, and he's showing them uh, a component in our micro milling room that I referenced, the technical depth and skill there is uh, unique and unmatched throughout the world. But exposing these students early on to understand that this is available right here in West Michigan is vital to our West Michigan manufacturing talent. I mentioned the manufacturing camps. Um, MI Career Quest is an event that uh, occurs once a year. It is a unique event in West Michigan that provides up to 10,000 students the opportunity to engage in a variety of industries. Obviously, we focus on the advanced manufacturing sector, um, but it's another way that the, the GBSU um, school and, uh, and our alignment of, of talent development sit next to each other and support each other Similarly to Manufacturing Day, we're one of the largest regions in all of the U.S. to support Manufacturing Day activities. And so these things are, are, are elements that lead us to success as we develop our, our talent pipeline. I mentioned already we sit on advisory boards, we provide mentorship, our guest speakers, and resume and interview prep. And again, these are all things that we've been invited to because of the relationships that we started to extend into the community and we feel are vital to our long-term success. Go ahead, next slide. So I'm gonna skip to the applied r and I'll come back to the experience, experiential education, and talent recruitment in a moment. Um, and, I, and I think this was really a, a blessing of the relationship. Um, so we had the opportunity to participate in an industry-sponsored graduate fellowship. We had um, uh, Tan Beer join our team in 2016. And what I think is significant is to reckon, uh, recognize that we knew we had projects that we didn't have time to get to, and we needed somebody that could do the research and application for us to help build that um, alignment. And so the benefit of the industry-sponsored graduate fellowship was that we could dedicate someone to the research and design and recommendation to help us guide on a process that's relevant for our success. And what we targeted happened to be uh, the emerging technology of scanning and light systems to be able to identify uh, defects within high volume components. And so on the left there, you can just see an analysis that was provided by Tanvir. And, and in the, um, the way that we conduct our co-op 
programs, we make sure that our interns and our co-op students present the summary of their findings at the end to our executive leadership team, providing either completion status or recommendations to make sure that we follow through and finish the projects. Um, we're also looking at the same model for the HBCU um, uh, uh, relationship that uh, Casey mentioned. Uh, we're excited about that um, talent pipeline, not only for the skill set, but also because uh, the fact that these students are looking to come to West Michigan and participate in STEM focused uh, careers. Um, and, and we're all aware in, in talent development, the need to find individuals willing to come into West Michigan and step into these high demand, um, high expertise fields. On the right, you see a, an image of a, um, a, a face covering. It wasn't deemed to be a respirator quality. Uh, we could pursue that, but this is something that we partnered with Occupational Health and Safety to have fit and breathability testing for a prototype uh, face mask that we were working on internally. Um, this was right in the middle of the pandemic. As soon as, uh, as, soon as we started to realize the long stages of this, uh, the COVID pandemic, we got to work on trying to provide solutions. Uh, what was fascinating about this is not only was it the OC Health relationship where we do design and fit testing, it was the material recommendations. And then we had actually partnered with a student, a former GBSU um, eng mechanical engineering and PDM, I'm sorry, it was a PDM student to help do the design is that individual already had the gasket developed. And so there was another partnership uh, built really through the co-op program um, that enhanced the speed of development for this process. We did actually turn and sell that into the life sciences uh, uh, division for NN. Uh, and uh, last summer, we actually sold that off. But the, the, the behind that, behind the scenes, the energy uh, was supported through Oc Health at GBSU. Next slide. And then the continuous learning. So um, we leverage the school as many ways as possible. And whether it comes to the, re um, the recruitment and retention side, we offer our students an opportunity to have tuition reimbursed up to $5,250 a year. And that includes the graduate side. So we've had individuals uh, take uh, their master's in business administration through GVSU. And then we also participate in the various activities such as the Right Place Manufacturing Leadership Summit, which is coming again back to the Eberhard Center here in October. Uh, this conference, not only the, the morning session here, but the opportunity to have our leaders come and see the other projects that engineers uh, are crafting and developing for other companies. And then uh, the Van Andel Global Trade Center, as we continue to be aware of the shifting dynamic of global trade. And then we've even had uh, one of our former vice presidents of sales uh, complete the commencement speech. I think it was in 2014, Paul, is that accurate? There we go, I got the head nod. All right, and maybe the meat and potatoes. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Michael. So when we think of the co-op program and experiential education, I think the biggest thing for our benefit is that the students at GBSU are learning um, the technical, um, you know, the, uh, the academic, but when we get them here as a co-op student or um, even prior to that, what we call a summer machining internship, what we can do is provide the context for them to apply their academic instruction. And I think the significant for us is that significance for us is that our intentional focus is that they start out on the machines next to our machinists and technicians that they'll eventually support as they grow through their co-op relationship. That segment of time, we generally target eight to 12 weeks of machining experience, lays the foundation for the success of the co-op. It's important for them not only to understand what our technology is capable of, the processes that they'll be designing to, but also the respect and the, um, the relationship with our technical team that's on the floor. We believe that a great engineer is not sitting at the desk, but in, in close to the process and responsible to the customer throughout their entire product development. And so um, they are responsible for not only product, process, but also quality and ownership of their, their particular part. And the thing that we've also done is we've been able to expand 
GVSU's model into our computer science and our IT structure. This year, we hosted two individuals that were that have been writing software code for us internally, and they have been a huge asset as we have launched not only new programs here in Kentwood, but also the ability to support our expanding organization across North America and the world. And on the talent recruitment side, you got to have a little fun, right? And knowing our organization is, um, you know, fuel delivery and uh, an automotive focused. Um, our team had the vision of joining the SAE Formula One uh, as a sponsorship. Um, we're actually hosting uh, the next group of students here. I think we're targeting uh, right around Labor Day to have them take a tour through the facility, but we've been privileged enough to have the, uh, a car out here and have it driven around the property. Um, I mentioned Chris Babbitt's support uh, through the Career Center, but the opportunity to participate in speed interviews or co-op presentations and receive student referrals uh, when we have students that are looking uh, for a placement that haven't been able to find a spot. We are, we are grateful to receive those resumes as well. I touched earlier on the HBCU support, uh, but it's an it's a, uh, important activity for us regionally to be able to not only welcome students with diverse background and population, but to be welcoming to students that are interested in coming into West Michigan and supporting that talent pipeline. And I, uh, I have to uh, point out our scholarship program. Uh, we've partnered with the university since 2012 um, to offer a scholarship. And uh, you know, it's, it's been a fantastic pipeline. And, it, and, and honestly, it helps our executive team realize the potential of the student engineer that's coming out of the GVSU program as they do the interviews and we select the student uh, for their scholarship. Next slide. Just gonna give you a brief way that we uh, evaluate the three co-op experiences. So on the left, you can see that, uh, you know, we have a, an SAS uh, Torno screw machine. Um, it's a, an old piece of equipment, but it, it, uh, it runs like a top and it provides high volume, precise uh, machining for us. Uh, and that's the focus of their first co-op is making sure that they're familiar with our equipment, whether it's, you know, 70 uh, from the seventies or whether it's, you know, a cutting edge piece of equipment that we just brought in last summer. Uh, and then we focus more on the statistical analysis in the second co-op. And then the third is really around the design and or problem solving activity. But then you can see on the bottom here, we want our students to have uh, a, a variety of experiences. We don't expect them to complete all of these things on the, by the time that they're done with their three co-ops, but we wanna see a, a, a width of knowledge and exposure so that they can start to understand where they um, enjoy the effort and work um, so that they can have input when we come to making an offer as to what type of technology they want to focus on in the teams that they've been working in. Next slide. You know, this is a, a piece of the technology that's on the floor. And again, it's just emphasizing the need for our students to be familiar with our manufacturing processes. And I want to highlight here, it's, it's fun to tell the story. There's 105 of these things in the world, and there's only three in North America, and two of them sit on our floor. And so when students kind of start, when they start to conceptualize how, um, how significant the technology is that you bring to the table and how, um, how it's accessible to them to learn and develop on it, uh, it bridges a gap between kind of that academic uh, activity and really the, the hands-on component. Next slide. This is an example of um, a second rotation uh, level skill set, right? So we had an intern, a co-op student, build and design this for machine runoff, working with the builders uh, to make sure that, um, you know, not only was it doing what we anticipated, but it was reliable and repeatable. Uh, the gauge, you know, the correlation and making sure that, uh, you know, we were, we were seeing the values that we want um, in that process. And then making sure that our internal team understood what this tool was for, right? Making sure that the, the secondary machinists and um, the individuals uh, servicing that uh, turnstile um, dimensional machine were up to speed with the expectation of performance and uh, how to operate the equipment. Next slide. And so this was uh, a product launch opportunity that our student had an opportunity to go through. And 
I, I highlight this because not only is it a technically demanding component, there are several components, but it was also a leading um, business opportunity for us. These were the first handful of parts for our customer in this particular application. It was a new segment of business. We knew it had significant potential. And we didn't hold back on putting one of our co-op students right in the midst of that development. They were mentored by senior engineers. Uh, this was a long-term strategy opportunity. And so we make sure that the student experience is highly significant uh, and it's strategic to our ongoing success. We want the student to know that they bear a responsibility for our organization as well as our engineers that are part of that process. All right, and just a couple more slides here. Last, um, I actually uh, shared this with students when I present uh, for co-op presentations. And it's, just, and it's a question that I asked a couple of our co-ops after they completed the rotation. And what do you, you know, now, now what you know, what do you wish you knew before? And I'll just highlight that AutoCAM, you know, the process are very, processes are very complex. It takes a lot of skill and experience of employees to accomplish the advanced manufacturing processes that we do. Very few companies can compete with AutoCAM because of our competency and precision manufacturing capabilities. And, and you know, that's the reason I share that with this group is this is a, you know, a student that's 10 months away from graduating, showing an appreciation for the complexity of what occurs here, but also I think an appreciation for their academic foundation that they had to have to be able to realize how challenging, um, you know, the, the, the market is for what we're doing. And secondly, um, the next slide here, you know, what have you liked? What have you loathed? I like using that word. And they highlight the people and the fun and they acknowledge that as an engineer, some tasks can get repetitive, uh, but it's a, it's, a, um, it's a necessary and critical process to make sure that our manufacturing teams are successful. So I'd like to wrap it up and I'd just like to say thank you to the university. We continue to explore our relationship and how we can deepen that going forward. And that's all I have. Thank you, Steve. We certainly, we certainly appreciate everything that you've done and I've seen everything your students have done, which is really wonderful. Great challenging experiences for all of them. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to introduce our final guest speaker, Ms. Mary Andrade. Ms. Andrade is the Career Center Director at the University of Louisville. She's also the current American Society of Engineering Education Cooperative and Experiential Education Division Chair. Before I pass the floor to Mary, I'd like to mention that the Padnos College has been extremely supportive of faculty and staff involvement in the ASW organization, particularly the Experiential and Co-op Education Division, as it is the hallmark of our engineering program. That being said, faculty and staff have had many leadership positions through the years. Over Dean Pukowski's 30 year career, he has held multiple positions. Interim Provost Chris Pluff and former Assistant Director of the Career Center, Tom Demon, have also had numerous board positions. Uh, these gentlemen paved the path for the mandatory co op program and work with their ASWE colleagues in order to do so. In the past couple of years, I carried the work forward in a program chair role, bringing in numerous guests. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor over to Mary. Mary, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Just want to make sure you can hear me. Looks like you can. Okay, perfect. Okay, so today I just want to talk a little bit about the American Society of Engineering Education. And um, very much like you, you heard from, from Steve, um, what, we, what we care a lot about is sharing those best practices um, from both education and industry. So I uh, really enjoyed your, your talk, Steve. And um, within the American Society of Engineering Education, it's, it's basically the, the national organization where education, um, engineering education is, is the primary focus. And within that association, there are multiple divisions, over 50 divisions, if I remember correctly. And within each of those divisions, there's a focus on a particular area of engineering education that is um, important to those individuals that are members. And the organization that, that I'm the current chair of is the, the SEED division, which is the Cooperative and Experiential Education Division. And if you'll just move to the next slide. 
So our division is um, focused on the integrity of cooperative education, primarily um, with academia and industry. So um, we look to promote cooperative education, improve services to employers. Um, we also work within engineering technology um, and what that looks like with business and industry um, at both the, the national and the international level. So um, we also emphasize professional standards and um, accreditation of cooperative education programs. And over the last few years, we've actually been working on expanding our vision of what um, experiential education looks like. Um, engaged education, hands-on education, um, to include other areas as well. So we also look at um, service learning programs within engineering and project-based learning, which has multiple applications um, everywhere from the, the freshman to the, the PhD level. Um, we talk about capstone projects, of course, cooperative education, which is how we were founded, as well as internships, and now even moving into the area of apprenticeships. Um, so each of those different areas is, is, is of importance to us. And so as an organization, um, we're basically a gathering of thought leaders um, in this area very interested in experiential education and how that impacts our students and how that impacts um, their readiness in terms of going out into the industry. So our goal is to create spaces for conversation, just like this conference, um, between educators and engineering and those industry representatives about everything from um, curricular content, um, workforce skills gaps, um, industry 4.0, but basically um, we want to develop a feedback loop from industry into engineering education um, to address the needs of, of industry. And we do that through a variety of different ways. Um, and if you can move on to the next slide. One of them is a conference that we host in the spring and that's called the, the CIEC conference which is a conference for industry and education collaboration. And there are four separate divisions of the American Society of Engineering Education that meet at this conference. And it, it truly is a practitioner's conference. So um, we might look at some research, but it's going to be typically how that's applied within the, the engineering and industry um, areas. So the, the divisions that we work with are the College Industry Partnership Division, the Continuing Professional Development Division, um, of course, the Cooperative and, and Experiential Education Division, and Engineering Technology Division. So very much those areas where industry and education, engineering education have to come together um, to, to meet. And our next conference, and you're of course invited, is in February. And so we would certainly welcome um, you to come and attend that. And then I also wanted to mention the, the ASWE conference, which we just concluded um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, at that conference, it's basically a research focused conference, but we do, um, we have a lot of industry representatives there as well, talking about the, the research um, that they have done with our engineering um, education partners. And, and within that conference, we will typically host a distinguished lecturer, um, multiple panelists, and um, technical research sessions. And um, just to give you an idea of what some of that looked like this, this year, um, we had panels on transitioning experiential education learning online. So um, very much focused on COVID and, and how did educators and industry um, respond to that. And we did have both industry sessions and um, education sessions on that. And um, so just best practices in terms of what that might look like and, and giving ideas and lessons learned and all of those things. And then uh, we also did um, supporting a, di a diverse student body for experiential learning opportunities. So basically looking at issues of diversity and how to create um, workplaces that support um, students with diverse backgrounds. And then we had technical sessions on um, the role of experiential learning at the modern day public engineering institution. Um, 
with campuses in, in the California region in terms of what that looks like. Um, and some of those were new cooperative education programs that um, have recently been developed and um, sort of a different approach, a more modern day approach to cooperative education. Um, experiential learning across and beyond the curriculum, and then international engagement, outreach, and broadening um, participation in STEM. So some outreach and collaboration between industry and um, educational institutions to draw in students from the middle school and high school level and how to approach different ways of developing that talent. So um, some of that is apprenticeship, some of that is summer camp, some of that is tours. Um, so just lots of different things. But but these are, are the ways that we we create those spaces for communication. Um, and then the last thing, if you just want to change the last slide. <laughs> So I just wanted to give you some action items. If it sounds like something that you would be interested in, of course, we'd love to have um, additional participation. Um, you can always join the, the, the CE and the, the seed division. There's also other corporate divisions as well. Um, I just, I'm particularly highlighting this area because I, um, it's important to me. <laughs> and I'm guessing it's important to you if you're attending today. Uh, but then we also have some some lower level participation. We do have a LinkedIn page, um, and I can pop that into the chat if anyone's interested. Where we um, we host town halls, we'll, we'll publicize our town halls. Um, we have a town hall coming up on um, working with students um, in neurodiversity areas, um, and then we also have one coming up on um, apprenticeships in higher education and the, the Department of Labor's um, funding for universities in that area and how they're working with industry to truly meet um, skills gaps in those areas. So we have one of those coming up as well. And then we're going to be doing some best practice highlights. So um, we're just rehashing our LinkedIn page and moving it from a group to a page um, to help it be more active and to invite student, uh, not students, employers from outside of our area that may not necessarily be ASWE members to participate and start in those conversations with us. And then, of course, we'd like to invite you to join us for the, the CIEC conference. Um, and then my, I'm assuming my contact information will be available if you, if you do want to follow up on that and would be interested, I'm happy to share more information on, on how to participate in that. And that's all I have. Thank you so much for letting me talk today. Mary, if I can jump in, um, back up a couple slides, if you would, to the CWE or to the CIEC conference slide, please. Um, two things. One, um, we have and will continue to sponsor an individual membership um, for our corporate partners uh, that decide they want to become involved in CWED uh, and uh, for a year, give you a chance to see how this works um, if you elect to um, join us at the CIEC conference. So if you're interested in that opportunity, reach out to me and um, I would point out it is a phenomenal opportunity for our corporate partners to connect with multiple institutions across the country um, to help facilitate uh, moving your internship and co-op programs forward uh, at a variety of institutions. Uh, particularly helpful if you have uh, multiple sites. Uh, Steve, you joined us a couple of years ago for CIEC. Uh, I think the last one pre-COVID. Uh, worthwhile experience from the corporate side? Yeah, absolutely. And, and to your point, when you have multiple locations, um, to have individuals coming from colleges and universities that are looking at experiential education, it's a great uh, bridge building opportunity. Thank you. We also play golf. Oh, it, it is uh, always in a warm climate in the beginning of February. And uh, yes, we provide networking opportunities in uh, uh, heavily subsidized network opportunities in uh, on the golf course as well. And as long as you uh, bring some of your own balls, uh, I haven't been able to support as many as Steve loses. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Pukowski and Mary. 
Um, we appreciate everything you've done, um, certainly for us with ASW and the university. And at this point, I'd like to pass the floor over to Career Center colleague, Chris Babbitt, who will facilitate the Q&A session. Hey, you, Diane. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, if you haven't noticed yet, uh, please uh, drop questions into the chat or the Q&A area, and we can um, make those live for our panelists to answer. Uh, a few notes um, before we jump to the first question. Uh, in the chat, uh, Mary has just put up her uh, contact information in the LinkedIn page, so be sure to check there. Uh, there was a question earlier about the slide deck and the presentation here that will be on the website. Uh, uh, Assistant Dean Talenwood has put the information in there too. Uh, even though Dean Plotkowski did answer this first question here, I'd like to address it uh, back to him for uh, a live uh, response. So. An attendee asked, understanding that 70% of graduates remain in West Michigan, is that largely because of the location of the co-op employers? Have graduating students been surveyed to understand if there are other reasons? Dean Plakowski? So um, as I indicated in the chat, yes, we actually um, do, as part of our continuous improvement processes, um, we survey our alums frequently for feedback on the programs and their uh, effectiveness and that sort of thing. The consistent message that we get back from our alumni uh, is that it's the connections they make in West Michigan uh, while they're pursuing their degree that really uh, convinces them that this is the place they wanna build their career. The connection with the university, the connection with uh, an employer through co-op, connection with an, usually another employer or more through the industry sponsored projects um, and getting to know the, the community and the quality of life here. And um, the reference there is only 30 to 40% of our students come from West Michigan, but over 70% of our alums um, stay here when they finish their education. Um, I should also point out that the 30 to 40% that do come from West Michigan have a um, pretty big influence on the, on the others in that um, college age students is when you tend to, lead, to meet your uh, life partner. And uh, if 30 to 40% are from here, that doesn't hurt either. But it's really the connecting with the communities that seems to make the big difference for the alums. Thank you. Uh, this question is for uh, Steve Heatheis. Going back to the co-op experience, Steve, uh, how customized are the positions for co-op students and how much do you consider a student's background before creating the co-op plan for them? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, we focus heavily initially on making sure that our co-op students understand the machine and process. Uh, our intent is that they'll get certified in at least one, if not two different pieces of equipment, two different operations. Um, and the benefit to that is it helps them uh, not only, you know, know the, know the material and know the, know, the, know the process, but then it helps uh, kind of guide the next two semesters really from a technical standpoint as to the type of things they're interested in, right? You know, if, if, it, if, if that particular process has you know, some robotic applications in it or vision pieces, or, you know, maybe it's uh, their second project could be an ancillary piece of equipment design and build. Um, it, it starts to get flushed out. And maybe a, a good uh, example is our, our current um, returning co-op this fall. Um, uh, Madison has excellent background prior experience. Uh, she came in, the first rotation was during, you know, May of 2020, which was, uh, uh, congratulations to her for sticking it through, obviously, in a very atypical experience. Uh, she had uh, manufacturing background, so we actually adjusted our plan to, to leverage that skill set and knowledge and help her do some product coordinating and guidance for us. Um, and, and, and in the middle of the pandemic, we were you know, shifting demands uh, frequently as, as customers were either operating or stopping. Um, but this third rotation, we have a project based on the first two where she's really started to flourish and express interest where she's going to be designing some, um, uh, some offsetting automation. Uh, and it's going to be right in a wheelhouse that I think 
from a prob problem solving and project standpoint really will fit her. And so we do a blend. We look at the, diff the different business need and then what are the skill sets coming in and, and try to make sure that they align so that the student really has a robust third experience. Steve, um, you might want to mention that Madison is a non-traditional student and um, the opportunities uh, probably connected you with somebody you might not have connected with otherwise. Oh, absolutely. And it, it, the, and I think that's the significance of the relationship that we've developed. Um, the, the scholarship program led us to this, uh, to, to Madison, who is an, a, is an outstanding future engineer. Um, and as you mentioned, the non-traditional um, student that she was, uh, because the scholarship uh, was provided to her, it, it helped um, helped her get on the track that she desired to be able to complete her education in the time period she was interested in. So they, they worked in tandem to really find a successful recipe. I think that's a great point. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the next question is for Mary. Mary, uh, I know you touched on this, but maybe go into a little more detail for our audience members who really want to get involved in ASWE. Uh, CEED, what are the requirements for joining and how would they go about attending that conference that's coming up in February? Thank you. Yeah, so um, that's a, a couple different questions, but so the, the ASWE membership is directly off of the ASWE website, which I can pop that into the, the chat link as well. And um, there's, of course, a membership fee. Um, but the, the division fee, I think, is, is like $10 or something like that. But you can attend the CIEC conference without being a member, um, which is just another way to get involved. So um, I can, let's see, I can provide the, actually, if, if anyone's interested in attending that conference, I can make sure that you get um, information about that through our, our list serve, um, and I can send that out. We don't currently have the registration available, but it will be available shortly. But I can provide the um, the link to the website where the registration form will be, um, as well as um, the information about um, ASWE. So Mary, just email their interest to you? Certainly. And if you're interested in golf, we know who the coordinator is for that. Make sure you mention that as well. Thank you both. Um, Steve, you mentioned uh, a piece about student feedback. How do you incorporate that into uh, developing future co-op plans and programs for students? Yeah, we do a couple of things. There's the informal interaction, of course. And then the more significant is we, at the end of the semester, we align for the students to give a presentation and we really want them to answer three questions. First of all, um, you know, what did, what did you contribute, right? What was it that you worked on? Second of all, you know, what, did, what was the value that the organization received, right? Try and put that in perspective. And then third, how does it align with your educational interests and future interests? So we asked them to provide that back to our executive leadership at that end of semester piece, you know, in a more formalized and direct way. Um, and interestingly enough, when we do our scholarship um, application as well, we generally include those students as a presentation component to our future scholarship, uh, you know, potential recipients. And so they get a refining process to talk about, you know, what they want to do, um, you know, beyond uh, their, their co-op with our organization. So uh, the informal piece is, uh, you know, throughout, we have a review that we generally do with them about two thirds of the way through, but then that, that formalized piece, I think really gives them a platform to share their perspective. Excellent, thank you, Steve. Uh, I don't see any further questions in the uh, chat or q and I'll give it one extra second if somebody in the audience has one. If not, we can move on to the next slide. I don't see any questions coming in. And this is just a reminder of what Steve had mentioned earlier about the Manufacturing Leadership Summit coming up on September 23rd, which will be hosted on Grand Valley's downtown campus at the Everhart Center. 
Uh, again, these slides will be available to you on the website, so you can click on that link later, uh, register and plan to attend. So um, please uh, hope to see you there. I think we can move on to our final slide here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. At this time, I have the distinct honor, honor of announcing the 2021 Co-op Awards. Due to the online format, I'll only be announcing the recipient names and awards. Without further ado, the Co-op Award recipients are as follows. Co-op Student of the Year, Ms. Abigail Hendrick, 2021 Computer Engineering Major and BSc Candidate who is employed with Gentex. Congratulations, Abigail. Co-op Faculty Advisor of the Year, Dr. Sanjavan Manaharan, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Second time award recipient. Congratulations, Sanjavan. Co-op Supervisor of the Year, Mr. Andy De Rosia, Test Engineering Manager from L3 Harris. Andy was nominated by 2021 Computer Engineering Senior, Mr. Richard Kirchlau. Thank you, Richard, for your support in this nomination and congratulations to Andy. Co-op Employer of the Year, DornerWorks. DornerWorks has had a long-standing history of hiring within GVSU's network and is very supportive in multiple collaborative efforts. Congratulations to everyone at Dorner Works. We've loved working with all of you and the students there, and we would really like to extend that thank you and, and congratulations again to Dorner Works for everything that they've done. Uh, that concludes the announcements of the Co-op Awards. Please be sure to check out the video coverage of all the award recipients that will be posted on our social media sites. And thank you so much to all the wonderful panelists and the guests that have been joining us today. In closing, we'd like to thank you for your ongoing support and look forward to working with everyone in the future. Enjoy the remainder of the conference.